And now to tell us more about the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, I'm joined by Eugene Chesovsky. Eugene is a geopolitical analyst on Russia and Eurasia. Eugene, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I want to begin by talking about Mariupol. I'm sure you just heard what everybody had to say. Clearly a very dire situation for the Ukrainian troops sheltered in that ironworks factory. What's your feeling after hearing what these leaders said, both from the UN and President Putin? Once that city falls, what kind of important land link is that going to be for the Kremlin? And what are these Ukrainian forces? Do you really see a humanitarian path out of Mariupol for them? Well, as you mentioned, militarily, this is a crucial city for Russia to control because it will really complete that land bridge that they're trying to achieve from uh, Donbass to Crimea. Uh, but from the humanitarian standpoint, I think there is some potential, as we've seen now with the UN Secretary General visit, some potential for progress to create some kind of corridor. Now, they said that there was an agreement in principle. It'll be really important to see the specific details of that because one of the areas of contention is where those civilians, I mean, the military, uh, you know, there's not going to be a corridor for them, but the civilian population that's underneath that uh, steel plant, whether they'll be allowed safe passage to Ukraine or perhaps ferried uh, into Russia or Russian controlled territory. So I think we could see progress there, but certainly from the broader military and geopolitical perspective, you know, Mariupol is pretty much set in stone at this point as, as a you know, as a very uh, significant part of this conflict for Russia. Indeed. And is there a more nebulous term than agreed in principle? Clearly, the UN Secretary is doing what he can, first being in Moscow and then going on to, to Kiev. Do you see any reason, any hope for steps toward a ceasefire? I think we're still quite a ways away from that, unfortunately. So the negotiations are happening not to the same level that they were early on in the conflict in terms of the actual delegations of Ukrainians and Russians meeting with each other, although I think there's still some virtual talks going on. Uh, but those negotiations are largely happening on the battlefield. And I think with Russia making clear that its next phase of operations now is focused on uh, Donbass and eastern Ukraine, I, I don't think we're going to see much diplomatic progress until we're going to see more movement on that one way or another. Russia has made some progress, but it's been very slow, and Ukraine has been able to retake some territory outside of that conflict area. So unfortunately, I think right now, those talks will be happening essentially on the battlefield. And let's talk about the United States as well, meeting with 40 of its allies, clearly preparing for the long term and, and, uh, and trying to come up with some kind of military assistance for Ukraine, and also Putin issuing a warning about that. Do you really believe that even nuclear uh, that limited nuclear weapons could be in play. Do you think that's a possibility? I think that's highly unlikely and really is a tool that Russia can use as, as a threat, if you will, or to warn against escalation, because we've seen Russian officials speak against, you know, U.S. and NATO continued support of Ukraine in terms of weaponry, and that support is actually only increasing and, and, and starting to get into heavier weaponry as well which is obviously uh, you know, dangerous for the, for the Russian side and will complicate their goals militarily in Ukraine. So I think in, in that sense, you know, the, the use of nuclear weapons is intended as a signal, not one that I you know, think that Russia would use. And uh, you know, certainly uh, that they're going to be very careful knowing what would happen if that were to take place. But really, it's part of the atmospherics at this stage. And what about the question of humanitarian aid? First, our country is still donating, and secondly, even if they do, how is the aid reaching those who really need it? Right. So certainly countries are still donating. I think the UN was calling for doubling the levels of aid and trying to get $2 billion worth. We've seen uh, aid increase from, from the U.S., from individual countries. But the logistics are a challenge, especially amidst the ongoing conflict, even though you know Russia has focused its forces on the east. It's still... Um, targeting some of the transport infrastructure, exactly. which is meant, you know, for, for the military side, but it does harm, you know, things for like food deliveries and things of that nature. So this is, a, you know, even more reason for, uh, you know, the diplomatic uh, track to, to improve and, to, and hopefully for the, for the military side of the conflict to at least die down, if not uh, finish completely. As our reporter mentioned earlier, there are now attacks on rail lines. Uh, of course, that's the, the key way of moving things because driving on the roads has become so dangerous. I can only imagine the need for basic goods, though, is just so prevalent throughout that country. 
Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you're talking about really war-ravaged areas like Mariupol, I mean, that, that's really crucial to get those supplies. Uh, luckily, you know, P uh, Ukraine does have a lot of support in those direct borders with neighboring countries like Poland, which has uh, received a lot of refugees um, and other countries there. But yes, I mean, uh, as long as the conflict goes on and as long as Ukraine has to continue on those rail links uh, and to a lesser extent the road links, because the air is obviously out of the question right now, that's going to be a very uh, significant challenge from a humanitarian perspective. And Eugene, you mentioned it, uh, millions fleeing Ukraine. How overburdened are the neighbors? Uh, how are they faring these days? And especially Poland, which the last I had seen had taken in at least half of those refugees. Right. Poland, I think, is, at least as of right now, has taken in more than three million out of the five plus million that have left Ukraine. And that's not including the internally displaced. So that certainly creates a, a lot of, of pressures and uh, on the resources of Poland, but th they've been very willing to help out and they're getting broader institutional support from the EU. Uh, so it really depends on the country. I, I know other states, uh, such as Lithuania, for example, has actually benefited somewhat because they were facing a labor shortage and now they're getting some, you know, some of the refugees coming from Ukraine, which are, you know, highly qualified and in many cases uh, bring skilled labor to the country. So it really depends on each individual country, but certainly taking in millions like Poland, it, it does stretch the resources. Yeah, and those refugees are certainly coming with their share of uh, emotional baggage as well, traumatized. So a lot to talk about. Eugene Chelsowski, thank you so much. We certainly appreciate your insight. Thank you.